Hello. How are we all doing today? Great. My name is Ryan Davis. I'm the student director of the International Business Model Competition, and I want to welcome you to our second business model training. Um, to all of you who are here, welcome, and also to those who are watching internationally, welcome as well. We have a great speaker for us today, Tom Peterson. He's a BYU faculty. He's been here for five years, and he's going to talk to us about the business model canvas and then also how to validate and so I'm going to turn the time over to Tom to, to get us going. Let's have a hand for Tom. Well, thank you all for being here. I appreciate your attendance, and I hope that you'll get something valuable out of this. A big part of the process in uh, understanding uh, the business model competition is to focus on validation, how to validate you have actual customers that you can resolve the pain that they're experiencing and you can, you can help them to overcome that pain through your product. So I want to review a little bit. In the last uh, workshop, you were able to hear from Paul Alstrom, who co-authored Nail It Then Scale It with Dr. Furr of our faculty, Nathan Furr. Uh, you heard from Nile Hatch, Dr. Natch, Dr. Uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Hatch. Uh, Nile Hatch has been uh, an expert in entrepreneurship. He's a pricing expert and he spoke a lot about the method of ideation, how to come up with a good idea, a valid idea. And then you heard from Scott Peterson, who's the director of the Rollins Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology, in talking about the business model canvas and uh, kind of the startup cycle. So I'll review a little bit about that. The first uh, quadrant there is ideation and we work on that from, for the first couple of months of the school year help you identify an, an idea where there may be pain in the marketplace. And then you take the assumptions that you came up with within your idea and you take it to the marketplace, so to speak, to validate it. You go through a process of modeling or validating. And uh, I'll, I'll kind of go through further definitions of these as you go on. Uh, once you've gone through a cycle of ideas and assumptions associated with those ideas to try to validate or invalidate those assumptions, then you have discovered a pain, and you're able to model and validate what you've come up with. Then at that point, you get to the point of uh, forecasting or launching your business, raising funds, and then executing on it. So that's kind of the general model. Uh, again, in a simple form, I have these, uh, these arrows pointing the process of, of pivoting, where you go back and forth between an idea and the model, or back and forth between your forecast and your actual execution of your, of your business. Um, idea actually means to innovate. You usually don't come up with something entirely new. You innovate on something that's already in existence. You make a minor modification or change a feature or change something to make it uh, uh, more appropriate to a marketplace. Uh, modeling means to validate, to go out and speak to actual customers. And we'll talk about what isn't a customer and what is a potential customer in a couple of minutes. To plan means to forecast or come up with a financial model that you can take to the market to raise capital. And execution is to launch your business. So these are some of the, uh, the issues that you'll address in ideation. You'll address uh, you know, some of the, the ways of associating and coming up with, with ideas like you find in innovators' uh, DNA, innovators' dilemma issues. Jeff Dyer has written a book on our faculty about the innovator's DNA and the process of coming up with ideas. I'll skip through most of this, but uh, I wanted to point out this. The MVP is the minimum viable product. It's not um, the most valuable player, but it is the minimum viable pro product which you take to the marketplace to test it by showing somebody a paper mache or a cheap version, so to speak, of what you're trying to come up with so that they can tell you whether it's a good idea or it isn't. Uh, the, the minimum viable product permits you to test and validate, to show it to people, and uh, you'll vet your hypotheses or your assumptions through interviewing customers, interviewing live uh, candidates to pay for your product. If nobody will pay for it, it probably isn't a real product. You need to be talking to someone who says, yes, I would like that, and I would write a check for that right now because I want it. Uh, you go through multiple iterations. You continuously learn from your conversations with actual customers. So I'm going to go ahead and skip ahead um, and talk a little bit about the executive summary and what is, ex what, uh, is presented in an executive summary. Uh, after you've gone through this modeling process, then you say, OK, I've nailed the pain. I understand it. Let me forecast how many people want this product. 
how will they use it in the future? And I go through this process. This is essentially the submission for the Millennium Venture Challenge. Uh, this is an outline of the materials that you'd want to complete in that. And then finally, you go through the process of execution. If you go that far, if your idea passes muster, then you'll go into an accelerator or an innovation program such as Camp 4, which we did this past summer, where there were 17 teams or 18 teams that went through the process of forming a legal entity, coming up with an operating agreement, uh, passing out ownership and a vesting schedule with people and beginning to execute on the business by producing their product and taking it to market. Uh, another model for this, and this is what Scott Peterson showed in our last workshop, is kind of the same outline of what you go through to validate your concept and to, to uh, make sure you've nailed a pain. So the business model canvas com is comprised of, of nine rectangles. And you have in front of you a sheet of paper that has these nine rectangles on it. Now, the point of this model, or this canvas rather, is not to say that you should focus on each one of these in great detail, but to kind of be a checklist to help you understand which of the nine are most important to you. So the, the right side of this might be the more uh, outward facing or customer facing side of the canvas. And the left side might be the, um, the sourcing or the resources or the key people and relationships that are behind the scenes that strengthen your offering of the marketplace. So the right side of it is, is probably your early focus. Uh, depending on your product, depending on your market, depending on other things that you've learned in the marketplace, you will define which of these nine squares is most relevant to you. It may be all nine. As a checklist, you have to kind of walk through what's most relevant, whether it's the, uh, the channels you're going to approach, the customer relationships, the segmentation of those customers, or uh, key revenue sources. You have to walk through and define for your idea which ones are most relevant. So don't feel like this is something comprehensive and you have to uh, fill out every single square to great detail, but at least evaluate it and say, is this relevant to my offering? And some of them will be very relevant, some will not be. So my questions would be, uh, you know, or my outline of this would be, you know, it, it includes the elements to validate or invalidate your idea. And processes that you go through in the early stages will possibly invalidate many of your assumptions. I've discovered of myself that I'm autobiographical. I think you are too. We're all autobiographical in what we think people want. We say, well, I like uh, chocolate cheesecake. Everybody should like chocolate cheesecake. And we sometimes go into the, the market thinking that we know best. And we assert ourselves and we try and persuade our uh, interviewees or the people that we're talking with as potential customers to see things our way. And that's often a big mistake because we're supposed to be listening and not telling. We're supposed to be hearing and not selling. And uh, when we go through the process in the right way, we can validate whether our idea is good or not. Uh, our mission is to leave the building to talk to people. Uh, I'll go into this a little bit further, but if we only talk amongst ourselves, I will tell you that I think at this university in particular, we don't have the kind of diverse opinions that you might have elsewhere. And if you just talk to each other, you'll find that we validate each other on a lot of things. We don't like conflict. We're very agreeable. We get along, and we find that we have a lot of similar opinions. And that's not very helpful in trying to validate a product. In the bell curve of the world, we're probably on one end of the extreme bell curve. The mainstream in the middle wants other things than what we may think they want. So we've got to be very practical about that reality. I've been out there, again, with my own products before, asserting that they are the right product and discovering that customers did not want them. They did not want the product that I thought that they would want. Um, I, I believe in, in inviting a monologue. And I'll give you some methods of doing this in, in a few minutes. But try to listen to the third party. Try to listen to the potential customer and take careful notes on what they say. Why take notes? It's because if you've done 10, 15, 20 interviews with different people, you'll discover that you can't remember what they've said. You have to actually take paper notes or you know, write on your, on your iPad uh, the information that you gather, and you'll get good information. Uh, what is the business model canvas? It's these nine rectangles we've talked about. And it's a method for collecting and understanding the insights. It's not the be all, end all, but it's a good method for kind of collecting the, the, uh, 
you call it the boxcar sized issues so that you're addressing the right ones. So what makes the difference? For us, uh, innovation, it, well, I'll, I'll say it this way. At this university, we've been invited to a lot of external competitions, and we win a lot. We win big prize, big money. Uh, last year was a half a million dollars at different competitions all over the country. Why do we do it? Because we validate. We have done our homework, and judge after judge after judge, and I've been at these competitions with eight or 10 teams in the last couple of years, and uh, they ask tough questions. They say, how big is this market? What is the addressable portion of the market that you're going to go after? And how do you know? And our students say, well, we interviewed in person 65 people. And we did a Qualtrics survey, or we did a SurveyMonkey survey, and we got another uh, 300 people's feedback. It's because we validate. And the judges nod their head and say, yeah, you did your homework. By doing our homework, we discover whether our innovative ideas are valid or not. Uh, we listen. and. Uh, carefully listen to what is said. Don't interpret for yourself, don't write what you want to hear, but carefully listen to what's being said. Uh, scaling in, in, the, in the third phase of this um, startup cycle means selling. And uh, I've had a number of speakers come to my classes recently, and they've said, I was sort of, in, you know, I was excited about R&D, I was excited about where I was going with my business, and I forgot that the only thing that really mattered was top line revenues, generating sales, that's what validated my product more than anything. And I'd say in these external competitions, the fact of having revenues has been a powerful tool in, uh, in the judges recognizing who we really are. They say, if you've sold $50,000 worth of your product, then clearly it's a valid product. Um, ideas are nothing, execution is everything. We get excited about ideas, and ideas are good for three to 12 months. It's really fun to be an entrepreneur for about 12 months. And at the end of that, if you haven't generated a lot of revenues, if you haven't taken it to the next stage, it really isn't any fun anymore. Execution is hard, and it's, it's bigger than the idea itself. Um, I, I think that uh, when you go out to interview as well, uh, being able to recognize your own weaknesses and listen to others, have the humility to say, I really could be wrong. This is the feature set that I think people want. I think it's these 15 features, and it turns out they only want three of them. Listen carefully and adapt and be humble enough to accept the input of others. So validation is getting outside the building. Uh, it's talking with strangers. It can't be your mom. It can't be your roommate. It can't be your best friends. It can't be somebody you work with. Uh, it, it has to be someone who does not love you. If the person loves you, they can't help it. They say, well, yeah, Mike, I love your idea. Or Bob, this is a great idea. Or Jane, yeah. Uh, they just don't want to tell you that you got a stupid idea. But if they're strangers and you get outside of this building and outside of the bubble of the academic world and talk to actual customers, you'll find that they will blurt out exactly what they think because they don't care about you. They don't care to be nice to you. And we're too nice to each other around here. You know that. We're too nice. So we have to get outside the building and hear the bad news from people. Um, there are five magical phrases that I like to use to get a customer to monologue with me. I need them to, to tell me things. I need them to give me feedback. And if I show them my minimum viable product, it's my paper mache thing, and they look at it and they touch it and they say, well, so tell me a little bit about it. I give them very little information. I let them interpret and give me a monologue. And so here are the fat pitches I throw them to get them to take a big fat swing at my product and tell me everything that's wrong with it. I say, share with me. Share with me a little bit of, about what problems you have with this subject. Or share with me um, your thoughts on such and such. Um, tell me about, or tell me a little about your company and its problems. You know, and they start monologuing. And that's what you want. You don't want a dialogue. You want them to monologue and just say everything on their mind. Uh, help me understand. Clarify for me. Clarify is a fantastic word. Who doesn't want to clarify? We like to clarify. And specifically, what is your opinion? That's a dangerous question because it may give you a long answer. People will give long opinions. Everybody's got opinions, right? And then once they've spent all of their views and they've said everything they want to say, then you go back to your notes and you say, well, I noticed you said you didn't like it in, you liked it red and big and fast. Could you elaborate for me on what you mean by fast? And then let them talk for a while longer. So that's your mission, is to get people to monologue and take notes. 
So why take notes? Uh, in taking notes, you'll remember what was said. Uh, and if you've done you know, 10 interviews, you will forget. You just can't help yourself, but you will forget the things that are said. And, and frankly, you might be inclined to remember the positive things, to say, yeah, we had 10 interviews, and everybody liked that it was small and red and fast. And uh, you may forget that, no, four of them actually wanted it large and black and slow. And you have to um, be able to listen and take notes on what they say. Uh, you'll gather positives, and you'll forget the negatives if you don't. Uh, you'll find that you're autobiographical. We all are autobiographical, and we want to get validation for our initial assumptions when it may not be due. Uh, our competitive advantage in these invitational events has been over and over again our validation. So if you think, and you may be able to fool me in a classroom, you may be able to fool another professor in a classroom and let them think that you did a lot of validation, but in the real world, the validation uh, is, it's a harsh, cold reality that people don't buy your product if you don't validate. In the competitive world, uh, when you're going out in, in these uh, invitational competitions, you'll find the same thing, that unless you have carefully validated every step of the way, you've listened, you've taken notes, you've written down the high points, and you've invited people to monologue for an extended period of time, you will miss the market. That's the nature of it. And by the way, you'll spend a lot of time and money. You may pass on another career opportunity because you're pursuing this, and you may have known earlier if you ask the right questions. You may have known earlier the right answers and figure out early whether you've nailed pain or not. So that's, that's my uh, advice is uh, be very careful about validating now of all the things you can do. This is kind of the central piece of business modeling is to validate carefully, cautiously, get input from others, and it can't be from anybody who loves you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Tom. So uh, this is going to end then our, this, the portion of our training. Um, let me just, I just want to remind everybody, the next training workshop is going to be on December 3rd. It's a Tuesday, December 3rd. And again, I want to thank all of you for coming and those watching internationally.